Greetings, everyone. I'm so excited to be back. We took a little bit of a summer break with the Writing for Your Life monthly writers discussion group. And so this is our first one back in September 2023. And I'm really thrilled to have author and poet um, Marla Tavanio. Did I say it right? Taviano. Close Taviano. enough. Yeah. Okay. I knew I was going to I'm bad with last names. Um, and we, I met Marla oh, so this past spring at the Writing for Your Life conference in Atlanta, which was really a wonderful event. And um, she shared her writing during one of our readings and just her energy has was awesome. And she's, I just love what she shares on social media and we sort of become social media friends. So I've been following her work since Atlanta and just really interested in, in hearing what she has to say tonight. And um, in particular, this is sort of a selfish um, one for me because Marla is going to be talking to us about poetry and her topic. When I reached out to her, what poet, what topic did she want to talk about? She proposed um, writing prose from po writing poetry from prose. And I just thought that was really interesting. And so I'm really um, intrigued. And, and as I was mentioning, selfishly, I've been writing, starting to write more poetry again, and maybe others in the room are as well. So, um, and I know Marla, you're a Polish poet. And so I'm going to ask you if you don't, if you're willing to just start by telling us more about you and your work and kind of how did you get to this place in your life and your career? And then, you know, talk to us about your topic. So welcome. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for having me. Yeah, hi everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming on this Tuesday evening. And yeah, my story, I'm going to share some of my story and it's kind of funny because I <laughs> this is called creating poetry from prose and the whole idea is um you can create poetry in a lot of ways. The way I did it is that I took some prose that I had, big long stuff and carved away and whittled away until a poem was left. And I think that that is actually more accessible for some people instead of just staring at a blank page and then trying to put a poem on there. If you already have something that you wrote and you can pull pieces of that out and make it into a poem, that's one way to do it. Now, sometimes I'll just write a poem. It'll come out of my head like a poem, um, but I, wrote my first poems when I was six and seven years old. And then I didn't publish a book of poetry until I was 45. <laughs> and in between there, I have a lot of other books and I'm gonna be showing you those and I'm gonna be begging you not to buy them <laughs> because I'm a different person than I was when I wrote them. And so, but I will, I will show them to you. So I could have called this long story short because that's kind of the point. Let's take a long story and let's make it shorter. And so I've done a whole lot of things in my almost 48 years. And so I'm going to take that really, really long story and make it uh, a little shorter for all of you so that we can talk about poetry. I grew up in a small town in Ohio called West Liberty. I actually didn't move there until I was in sixth grade. It's where my parents were from and where they met in high school. And then they got married, moved away, and we moved back there when I was in sixth grade. So my grandparents, both sets of grandparents live there. I grew up there. I met my um, now ex-husband at a church camp. We were both counselors in the summer of 1996. We met on the basketball court. We got married in 1998, and we had three daughters in 2000, 2002, and 2006. And what I will say about that is that I've had a lot of people tell me, like a lot, lot, lot of people tell me, I would love to write, but I don't have the time. So I'm going to show you, this is the, my first book that I don't want you to buy. It's called From <laughs> Blushing Bride to Wedded Wife, Practical Advice from a Girlfriend, What Marriage is Really Like. And if you remember, I said my ex-husband, <laughs> which means I'm not married anymore, but I'm glad that when I was 30, I was giving out all this advice to young <laughs> women and how they can be good wives. So here's what I'll say about this. This is, a, I just pulled this off my bulletin board. This is how old my daughters were a couple months after that book came out, which means I wrote that book with these little people living in my house. <laughs> and so I, I made the time to write the book. Um, this came out in 2006. Okay, you ready for a, a string of four books that you don't want to buy? This came out in 2007. 
Is that all he thinks about? How to enjoy great sex with your husband. 2008, changing your world one diaper at a time. A reflective journey through your baby's first year. So these are all with Harvest House Publishers in Eugene, Oregon. And then this one, expecting, praying for your child's development, body and soul. And that's with Howard Books, which is a division of Simon and Schuster. So this came out in 2006, seven, eight and nine when I had little people um, in my house. And the sad sob story there is my books came out around the same time that I figured out that there was a thing called the internet <laughs> and I didn't know um, how to use the internet to promote my books. I wasn't even on Facebook. I don't know when that started, but I wasn't on Facebook until 2011 after my books had already been published. And I also didn't know that I, as the author, was responsible for promoting these books. I thought I could just write them, sit back in my chair and, and the publisher would take care of that for me. And they did not. <laughs> and so those books, um, one by one went out of print. This one is actually still in print. Uh, from 2009 till now, just last week, I got a royalty check for $167 <laughs> for six months uh, of that. And I split the cost. There's an illustrator who drew all the pictures of uh, the unborn baby, and she gets the same royalties that I do. I've never met her. I don't know who she is, um, but we, we share that money. So that's my writing journey up to 2009. And then that's also around the time that my faith started to shift and I started to question things. And that was kind of a slow process. I know for some people who started waking up to injustice and things around 2020, they kind of had a, a blast where they, they it was all coming at them at once. Mine was much uh, went a lot more slowly. And so I started waking up to different things. And I said, this is going to be a long story short and I'm making it long. But in, in 2014, no, let's back up a tiny bit. In 2011, my husband had a heart attack at the age of 34 and almost died. We lost our house. He lost his job, all of that. We moved into an apartment complex that was primarily Somali refugees. And we lived there for a year. And then in 2015, in January, we moved to Cambodia, where we lived until March 2020. We moved back right at the beginning of the pandemic on the last flight out of Siem Reap, Cambodia, left our oldest daughter and her Cambodian fiance in Cambodia because the U.S. embassy closed because of COVID. So for three months, I had some pretty severe anxiety because they were in Cambodia. There's no Western health care there. If they were to get COVID, they could die. Um, well, I guess you could die here also. Um, but then they got here, did an emergency visa interview in June of 2020 and got here. And in September 7th, Labor Day 2020, my ex-husband had gone to visit his family. He wasn't my ex at the time, came back and said he wanted a divorce, which was um, completely unexpected. And that's another whole story. So we won't tell that story um, tonight, but that's kind of where I was. So that's where I was in 2020. Um, in Within all of that, I had still been writing, but I had not published any books. Once my books started going out of print, um, it was hard for me to find another publisher who would take me on because I was kind of a liability. They'd rather take on a new author than someone who's had failed books. So I self-published a lot of eBooks and they were a lot about my journey, about life, about my husband's anxiety. I wrote one called Once Upon the Internet. In 2008 and 2009, our family of five went to 52 zoos in 52 weeks and we stayed with 31 families, 17 of them we had never met except on the internet. So I wrote about that. So like I said, we've done a whole lot of things, but let's talk about poetry and how that fits in. So this I found, I laminated this last year. It, I don't know if you can see, it says a note from dad, Father's Day, Community Grace Brethren Church. So this was a notepad in our house and I wrote a poem on it, July 22nd, 1983. So I was seven um, and it's called My Airplane. My little airplane, you go so far, you go fast, 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 faster than a car. My little airplane, you go so high, 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 high up in the sky. 
I don't know <laughs> where I got the idea to write about my little airplane, but here is one of my poems. Then I published a book of poetry in 2021, um, 38 years later. But let me tell you about a couple things that went wrong as I tried to do this. And also I was looking, I went down a rabbit trail of journal entries today because people have been asking me, when did you decide to make your book poetry? Because I've always tell people, I, I was writing about my faith shift. It was this big, long thing. And then at some point, boom, it hit me. I should turn this into poems. Well, when people would ask me how that happened, how it came to me, I have I have no recollection of that, none. Now, we were in the middle of a pandemic. My husband had just left. All of this is going on while I'm writing. So I understand a little bit why it was all so foggy. But I went back through a journal that I had on my laptop, just a Google Doc. And these are some things that I found. So this book came out. This is the first edition of it. It came out in September of 2021. That's when I self-published it. And in March of 2021, I wrote, I want to put my words into poetry. So there's that. In April, April 30th, I said, reading poetry really, really, really inspires me to write my own. And I am. I finally am. I wrote my first poems at age six. I'm going to publish my first book of poems 40 years later. In May, I talked about how I needed to, to be brave and start posting poetry online, something I had never done because I wanted people to, to see it before I put a book out so they would want to buy it. And then on May 11th is the first time I mentioned this title, Unbelieve, which is a little bit risky for me. The word unbelieve and the word heretic both being in my title, um, I was afraid would turn some people off and it definitely has. But one thing it has also done is no one's accusing me of being a heretic because I already called myself <laughs> a heretic. And depending on what your definition of heretic is, um, I may be one or I, I may not be one. You can decide that for yourself. But whatever you decide, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter to me either way. So, and then I, I wrote on May 11th, after I said unbelief, what excites me so much about this book is I've been struggling so much with the whole faith shifting book. How do I tell the whole freaking thing? How do I make it interesting? How do I leave out the boring parts? Why do I feel the need to explain every little dang thing? Poetry is the answer. Poetry is always the answer. It covers everything all the way down to, I can immediately start writing a second book of it and it doesn't matter at all what I left out of this one, OMG. I couldn't see the poetry for the prose is what I wrote. And I actually have a poem <laughs> called that in, in the book. I thought about making that the title, but, but then I didn't. So let me tell you about a couple mistakes I made because if you have questions about self-publishing after I'm done talking, feel free to ask me those. I, I may or may not be able to answer. What I may be able to do is tell you what not to do <laughs> more than what you what you should do. But this was my first try at this book. I only did it on Amazon because it was the easiest way. My ex-husband used to do my eBooks for me and he did all that layout. He's a graphic designer. I knew nothing. So when he left and was no longer there to help, I had to figure this out on my own. My daughter is also a graphic designer. So she designed the cover and I put it out on Amazon and a friend of mine got it before I did. And I don't know if you can see this, but the font is microscopic. Like you cannot, <laughs> you cannot read it. So there are, I don't know how many copies of this are out in the world where I didn't know that you had to fit the Google Doc size to match the book size. I didn't know any of this. So some people I traded them. Like I said, once I got it right. So here it is. This is how it's, it's supposed to be. Um, and this one has writing all in it because this is, well, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, but this one is correct. And so that was September, 2021. And before I get to the new edition, um, another long story short is that a friend of mine had me on IG live talking about my book and her literary agent saw me talking, reached out to me and said, if, are you interested in someone publishing your book? Well, my dream is to have someone publish my book, but I, what I assumed was that 
I needed to build a much bigger platform before I could get a publisher to publish my book. So I self-published this one thinking I can use this to, to get my platform up there, to get my Instagram followers up there after people read this book. And then maybe a publisher would take notice and, and publish my next book. But this was David Morris of Lake Drive Books who reached out to me and we had like a two hour Zoom call and he was in um, conservative Christian publishing for a long, long time. I had all these books that I'd written. That was what had intrigued him about my story that I'm now writing a book about being a heretic. And my second book by that time, this one's called Jaded, A Poetic Reckoning with White Evangelical Christian Indoctrination. This one was almost completely finished by the time that I met David. And so he said, if you send that to me, let me look it over. He looked it over. And a couple of days later, he sent me a contract and, and asked me if I wanted to do it through Lake Drive. So this is um, Lake Drive Books right here. Is It's a hybrid publisher. So I split the costs of of the initial publication with the publisher and then I get a higher royalty rate than I would with a traditional publisher. So back in the day, like I was saying, with this book that's still in print that I just got $167 check for from 2009, well, from, from sales this year still, um, I get about 63 cents per book that's sold. It's a little bit lower than normal because I, like I said, I split it with the illustrator. Um, but I get a whole lot more money <laughs> when, when I sell copies of these. So once I, so this was released in December of 2022. And then David and I started talking about re-releasing Unbelieve so that it was also um, with Lake Drive. So my daughter, just, she did a redesign of this one um, to make it match Jaded better and then so the spines match and then the back cover and by this time it was a lot lot better because i had people who had endorsed it and um my first run through i just have a whole lot of poems i didn't have sections i didn't have a table of contents with the sections there were a lot of things that i left out so all of that is um in the new edition plus all of the endorsements at the beginning and all of that. So the third book in the trilogy, and then that will be over and done, uh, tie a neat little bow, except I've realized there's not a neat little bow <laughs> when you're talking about your life and your faith deconstruction. But that third book will come out March 16th, 2024, and it will be blue. So I will have a purple book, a green book, and a blue book in a poetry trilogy. And I had no idea that this is how this is going to happen. So going forward in the future, I have a lot of ideas about books. Um, will I stick with Lake Drive? Possibly. David's also an agent who could shop my books around to other, to other publishers. I don't really fit um, with Christian publishers. I, I mean, maybe I do. Maybe there are some Christian publishers that are... Um, publishing books by people who are reckoning with Christianity and don't know if they want to be a Christian anymore. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, so we'll see, but I have a lot of other things that I want to write about. Um, really quickly, we're almost at the 20 minute mark where you can start asking questions, but I'm going to share just a couple um, quick stories that um Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you, this is what I would like to do. I did this this afternoon. I was looking through my books and I thought, okay, if I'm going to tell people that they could take prose and turn it into a poem, how can I demonstrate that? And so I thought, well, I'll just find some prose that I've written and I'll just turn it into a poem right now. Well, I started with this book and then I realized it's kind of triggering because it's my ex-husband is like on every single page. Same with this one. <laughs> so I got to this one um, that's about changing your world one diaper at a time. And I'm going to read the first little part of this chapter. It's called non-denominational motherhood because I took this first part of this chapter and I turned it into a poem. So you can kind of see how I would do this. I have no desire to turn any of my old books into poetry. <laughs> this is just an example. Um, okay, so this is how this chapter goes. Motherhood has more denominations than the Protestant church, and each of us usually thinks her mommy doctrinal statement is superior to the rest. 
we can all too easily get caught up in competing with each other, comparing ourselves to one another, and judging anyone who does things differently than we do. I'm going to make a bold statement. Believe it or not, I think we moms can all get along regardless of our parenting philosophies. I think we can choose to nurse our babies or bottle feed, rock our babies or let them cry it out, wear our babies or wear bikinis, and so on and on and on, and still love each other as fellow travelers on the same journey. Yes, I have my own ideas about how parenting should work, at least in theory, even if I can't seem to implement all of them in real life. But I'm not here to criticize your personal mothering choices, not for a minute. For the purposes of this book, I'm claiming non-denominational motherhood. I'm just going to sit up here on the fence, straddle it happily, and do what I can to appeal to moms on both sides. Okay, so this is my poem. And what I did, too, is I have a big chunk in here that I could cut out if I want a really short poem. So this is what the poem says. It's called, We're All in This Together. Motherhood has more denominations than the Protestant church. Each of us thinking our mommy doctrinal statement is better than the rest. Competing, comparing, judging, anyone who does things differently. Bold statement alert. We don't need to be alike to get along. Nurse our babies or bottle feed, rock our babies or cry, let them cry it out, wear our babies or wear bikinis. I don't want to pick sides. I'm straddling the fence and claiming non-denominational motherhood. And then the part that I can cut is from the whole compete. Like I would stop at is better than the rest. Come down. I don't want to pick sides. I'm straddling the fence. And one of the things that I, obviously I can't go into all of this poetry stuff in, in one short presentation, but when I talk about like I'm claiming non-denominational motherhood, I kind of like that little surprise at the end. That's what I try to do with some of my poems. It doesn't always work out because at the top, I say that motherhood has more denominations than the Protestant church. And then down here, I say I'm claiming non-denominational motherhood. So that's just a, a, a silly example of how I could take prose that I had written and make it into poetry. So that's what I did with this. I had written thousands and thousands and thousands of words. And I still have some of those somewhere. My poetry books are generally 15,000 to 20,000 words. For my third book, it's at 15,000. I just turned the manuscript into the publisher. I have a document with all of the words I cut from the book and it's over 40,000 words. <laughs> so a lot of what I initially write does not get put in the book. So I just wanna show you um, I dedicated the book to Rachel Held Evans, whose words, love, brilliance, and humility changed the entire course of my life over a decade ago. I dedicate it to you and me. If you're asking questions, having doubts, feeling anxious, even scared, I see you. I am you. This book is for both of us. And then this is what's new in this one, the table of contents, because each of these sections, let's do this, once upon a time, loving the poor, so many questions, quite literally. And so I start out, I talk about Rachel, and then I talk about how I, for four years, okay, five, now six, I try to write a book about my shifting faith, my unraveling beliefs, my evolving understanding, my blah, 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 blah. Highlight, delete, highlight, delete. Reading my own story should light me up, not put me to sleep. And that's kind of what was happening. Um, and then this one, bless his heart. My dad wants me to write a blog post detailing all of my theological beliefs and why I believe them so I can put an end to the confusion and people can stop calling me a heretic. And instead I wrote <laughs> a whole book <laughs> calling myself a heretic. Um, this poem is called Read Between the Lines. When everyone wants you to explain yourself, poetry is an act of resistance. So that was another thing. I was so used to having an airtight defense for every single thing that I believed. And I had to learn to let some of that go. And so that's what that poetry, what this poetry is. Are you there, God? It's me, Marla, and I have a lot of questions. Um, so that is, is this book. And um, yeah, I think that's, I'll, I'll stop right there. And Kate, I know you had some questions planned. I was actually talking to a few friends about this and they gave me some questions. So hopefully you all will have questions for me, but if not, I have some really good questions that I can ask myself and then answer them. <laughs> wow, well, Marla, amazing. Thank you so much for, <clears throat> for sharing your story with us and providing such rich detail of 
um, your process and including your writing lessons learned and pitfalls and successes. It's really so interesting. And I have a number of questions, but I'm sure everybody on the line wants to, so I don't want to take up too much, but I'm going to ask you a very practical question and then a sort of more conceptual question. So the okay. practical question actually, and I want to also give a shout out to David Morris of Lake Drive Books, who's a great partner of Writing for Your Life and was at the writing conference and has been a really incredible friend and mentor to me during this transition period with Brian Elaine. <clears throat> um so David's a great guy. And he said something on a call that I had with him the other day, we were talking about something completely different. And he must have, I bet he was referencing you and his work with you. Because he said, you know, if you're writing poetry, for example, you should put it, you, you can, you can share it ahead of time, like before you publish your whole book, but you can put it on social media. In fact, people want to read your book, your poems, like in that format. And and it was such an epiphany for me. And as you know, I think from, from our exchange on social media, I just published my first poem since ninth grade. So a little, I'm 45, mm -hmm. so about the same period of time. Um, and I just put it on my author blog and put copyright Kate H. Rademacher. And you, I think, inadvertently were the inspiration for that. So can you talk a little bit more about that, about how do you build a platform, quote unquote, as a poet and sort of introduce people to the idea that you write poetry, not just when you're a kid, but when you're a real life grown up and sort of how do you do that? And how do you sort of wet people's appetite with your poetry? And maybe I know the answer because of, um, you know, David's comment and my own experimentation with it, but can you just amplify or expand or, or disagree if I got it wrong? Thank you. Oh yeah. Oh. So, so I published the book in September, 2021, and I'm pretty sure. And again, I, like I said, it's a little bit foggy and fuzzy. April is National Poetry Month. So I have um, a bookstagram account. If you don't know what that is, it's just an Instagram account that's all about books and it's white girl learning. And there I learned over the past few years as I was doing this, that there are different heritage months and different literary months. It's so like February is Black History Month. March is Women's History Month. April is National Poetry Month. So on white girl learning, I'm reading poetry by black poets, indigenous poets, other poets of color. And on Marla Taviano, my personal Instagram, I think I did a poem every single day. My daughter, the one who designed these covers, who is the graphic artist, she just, um, I think we might have done purple. And again, I might be getting this wrong, but I think we did like a purple background because I knew my book was going to be purple. And I just took some of the shorter poems from the book that would fit easily on an Instagram square. And I just shared it. And I said, it's National Poetry Month. I'm going to share poems. And people like it was the response was amazing. And I think it was just because it resonated with people in in their journey when I'm talking about how my dad wants me to write a blog post so people won't call me a heretic or I can't keep up with my changing beliefs or um, I don't know what other short ones that I shared. There's a, oh, this one I remember. It's called Daughters of Eve. I haven't done the Latin, but I imagine there's a reason heretic starts with her which is one of the ones. So whatever it was that was resonating with people, they would they would start to say things and share things. And I thought, okay, this is really cool. This means that people will um, be interested when my poetry comes out. And it is storming out here. So hopefully, um, <laughs> like I'll just send this thunderclap. Hopefully I'm fine and we'll have an internet connection. Okay, we'll let you know, but if not, we'll read poetry while you're- Yeah, <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so- um, so yeah, I absolutely encourage people to, to start sharing that online. It is scary. You, you don't know what the response will be. Um, but by this point, I had been sharing things honestly for a really long time. So it, it what, didn't feel like a huge deal to me. And then I want to say in March of 2022, I started a sub stack and my sub stack is just one poem every Thursday. And one of the big reasons I decided to go with poetry is because there are so many words out there. So many words. Like I subscribe to a lot of people's Substack. I pay for several of my friends' Substacks. 
And there are times when I think I, I oh gosh, <laughs> that scared me. Did you hear that or no? Just, okay, right. I was like, I was like is that me just okay. jumping? <laughs> I think all of it. Look, everybody on the camera. Wow, poor Marla's coming to us from like a storm, or maybe that was the Lord. We don't know. Wow. That what were you was, saying maybe, when that happened? Maybe I'm being struck down for being a heretic. I don't know. No, I'm not scared of that. But <laughs> um, what was I saying? All right. Well, that tell was... us if you need to go, but keep going. I don't think I need to go. It'll just be if my power goes out and I can't be here um, anymore. Be a no, I. Ending. Oh. My Substack, I share yes. a poem every Thursday. And so sometimes it's a poem from one of my books and then I'll give a little bit of backstory. And sometimes it's a poem that I'm working on for my next book and I wanna see if it resonates with people. And this is kind of funny, but I have a paid section of my Substack. There are about 25 people that pay $5 a month and we just talk about writing. So it's like a little writing community. And there is a poem that I was going to put in my next book. And when my beta readers read it, so I had 10 people who read through this book, a couple of them said, I don't think this poem fits. And that really confirmed what I knew was that this poem did not fit. The reason I put the poem in the book was so petty. It was someone who disowned me, someone who was unkind to me. And I wrote a poem about that. <laughs> And I didn't use their name, but it was it was not in the spirit of the rest of the book. So I went to my paid substack that only these 25 people could could read. And I said, hey, here's a poem. I only put it in my book because it's petty and I'm sharing it here to get it off my chest. And it's not going to go in the book. And some of them were like, thank you for sharing. That's hilarious. We love it. And someone else said, you really should put this in the book. And then someone else said, no, you're right. You probably should not put that in the book. So, so yeah, sharing poetry. And it's, it's a funny thing now because people will call me a poet and I do have some imposter syndrome around that because I wrote the airplane poem, you know, in, in 83 and then, <laughs> and then I just decided, oh, Hey, I'm a poet. And I do want to encourage people. I want to show you this really quickly. I just got this in the mail. This is someone it's called love in all forms. It's 18 poems. And this woman who follows me on White Girl Learning, she said, could you, she's a black woman, has been following me for quite a while. She said, can I send you my book of poems? It's 18 poems. And she just made a book. Like she just put her poems in a book and there it is. This is another young woman who is 15 years old. And she just wrote her first book of poetry and published it. This is Morgan Harper Nichols. I don't know if you've heard of her. She has almost 2 million followers on Instagram now and four books, but this is a book of poetry. She self-published in 2017 because nobody knew who she was. And now she has 2 million Instagram followers and all of her artwork is available at Target. <laughs> so, you know, you never know what, what you can do until you give it a try, right? Oh, well, what an encouraging word and such a, I mean, I do think we all have imposter syndrome and that's one thing I want to talk about in writing for life more this year is this idea um, about who is a real writer. Um, because what I've realized in my journey of talking to a lot of writers, as I've been working on this transition with writing for life with Brian Elaine, the founder, um, is that a lot of people that I think we would definitely consider to be real writers are like, I'm not a real writer. So um, I think that a lot of us, you know, and, and, and so that would be another rich conversation, but I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole. So I want to open um, the conversation. I have another sort of big picture question and I'll hold that if we have more time, but does anyone who's in the room want to raise their hand or come off mute and ask Marla a question or provide a comment? Um, again, Marla, I just really want to say thank you so much. Your bravery and honesty and, and just your journey has really inspiring. So I'm really grateful you're here and look forward to this discussion. So let's just open it up. Does anyone want to come off mute? Yes, I'd like to ask, as you're talking about uh, feeling like a poser, uh, what it was your educational background that led you to writing? 
That is a fun question. <laughs> okay, so I, I've always wanted to be a writer, but I was under the impression, it's probably true, um, that you don't go to college to be a writer. <laughs> um, so I knew that I needed to come up with some kind of career plan. So I remember my guidance counselor, my senior year of high school, she's like, okay, you want to go to college? What do you want to be? I was like, I don't, I don't know what I want to be. And she said, well, here are the scholarships we have available. And she showed me these scholarships. And one was a $5,000 scholarship for someone who wanted to be a nurse. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll be a nurse. <laughs> so I got, I graduated co-valedictorian of my tiny class of 71 students in my small Ohio town. And I went to another small Ohio town in the middle of a cornfield, a Christian college called Cedarville College. It's now Cedarville University. And I went with my $5,000 nursing scholarship and another nursing scholarship that I got. And I made it through the first two quarters. We were on quarters, not semesters, of my general education classes. And then I got to a class called Introduction to Nursing. And we watched a video and there was blood and I couldn't look. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, <laughs> I don't think this is going to work out for me. So I went and talked to my advisor and we said, what, well, what could I be? Well, what were all the things that people told me I should be back when I was in school? A teacher. That's what everyone said. You should be a teacher. You should be a teacher. So I switched over to elementary education, got a new advisor. Well, my advisor, one of my, te one of my professors had me grade papers for a job. I also worked in the dish pit. I also did telemarketing, but it, my advisor hired me to write curriculum that he was supposed to be writing but didn't have time so i wrote it and then i'm also writing things as i'm grading papers so looking back all of the signs pointed to writer i just didn't know that was a thing so i graduated in three years and taught school two years full-time and subbed from september to december 2nd when my first child was born in 2000 and I never went back. I have never gone back to a job job since. Um, I got jobs writing curriculum for McGraw-Hill, and then I went on to write my own books, and now I, my books do not pay the bills, and I'm a single mom, so I write for other people. I write for some business people. I write for an organization that, um, that helps people who are on Medicare, Whatever I can find, that's what I write. So my background is, well, I can't say it's nursing or really education. It is. I do have it. I have a degree in elementary education that I didn't use for long. I still love to teach, but just not in a classroom with kids. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Wow, oh, great question and great answer. Thank you. Um, all right, who wants to ask the next question? You can raise your hand or you can come off mute. Lynn, okay, Lynn, you need to come off mute. Thank okay, you. so <clears throat> two questions. I, I liked Sarah Ephra's comment. When the lightning struck, she said it was God. I don't know how to make a comment like that. What do you do on Zoom to say a comment? That's not verbal. Down, down at the bottom, do you see where it says chat? Down at the bottom of your, your no, screen? Oh, uh, no. well then I, I probably can't help you. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the hey, best. Hey, Sarah, how do you do it? It's under, <laughs> the word more has three dots. You click those three dots and then you choose oh. chat. And you okay, can, got it. Got okay. it, Sarah. Thank <laughs> you. I was, I was going to say he was mad and then I chickened out. So then they sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here in SoCal, and to hear thunder is like such a treat. Thank you. Okay, my second <laughs> real question is, okay, so what is a substack? You mentioned that word several times, substack. Okay, so back in the day, I used to have a blog, and a lot of people did blogging, and then I people started blog, doing yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so I stopped doing that. I don't remember when I stopped. I did it for about 10 years. And then people started doing email newsletters where they would just get people to subscribe to their newsletter and they would send out a newsletter every week, every month. And then a couple years ago, 
um, there came, I don't know if there, I, I'm not really well versed in how many of these things there are. I just know that I heard about Substack. And so you can go to substack.com and look it up. My, I think to find me, it's like marlataviano.substack.com. And you just write stuff. And then people can click the subscribe button. And every time you write something, they get an email that says that Lynn has written something new in Substack. So like I said, my poems will come. If you subscribe to my Substack, you'll get a poem every Thursday morning at 7 a.m. And then if you want to pay, there are paid subscriptions. Um, they, I don't know if you can change them or not. I think they're generally $5 a month. Then for my paid subscribers, I write a different post just for them on Monday and another one on Thursday. So my paid subscribers get the Thursday poem plus the Monday and Thursday posts. And those are generally about writing, my writing journey, publishing, how that's going. They can ask questions and they also guest post. So some of the, since we're all not, we're not all writers. Some people are just there to hang out, but um, if they want to write about what they're doing, then I give, give them my platform. It's a tiny platform. It's just 25 people in this small group. But if you go to okay. substack.com, you can, you can find everybody's newsletters and you can subscribe. There's also an app that's really nice. And then there are some other things. There's a thing called um, notes, which is similar to Twitter where you can talk to different people. So it's a whole, a whole thing, a whole new world. Okay, so my last question is, would Substack be better than having a blog? I mean, would it have a um, bigger audience? No, I'm going to say I... yes. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I, I'm going to say yes, because you can connect to everybody else's Substack. And when people see that you comment, they can just, if you comment on someone else's, they could click on your name and it would go right to your Substack. So it's more of a of a community feel. You can share little pieces from your post right into the whole threads thing and then other people can see it. So yeah, I would say it's, it'd be definitely better for getting more eyes on your work and having more of a community feel. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Great question, um, Lynn and Marla. Thank you for your answer. And just so everybody knows, I'm actually thinking about hosting a Writing for Life event on because Substack is just one solution. There's also Medium, which is a popular blogging site. And I think there's pros and cons. And Mark Schaefer, who has been a long time sort of um, marketing role model of Brian Elaine, sort of talked in one of his blogs about the pros and cons of media versus Substack. So I think it's an interesting, for those who are interested in, in blogging, um, and I know there's others on the line who are as well, I think that it, this would be a good discussion for some follow-up because I know others have questions. So um, maybe we can tag this as another follow-up uh, question, but thank you for raising that, Lynn, because that's a great thank one. <clears throat> and I can put the name of the other platform in the chat. So are there other questions? Uh, Vicky, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add a bit on Substack. A year ago, I didn't know what I was doing. I have this whole book inside of me and didn't know how to write it. I ended up, uh, because of uh, a Writing for Your Life conference, learned about marketing consultants and how I could hire one, and I hired one. And, um, and she found Substack for me and recommended it for me because my ideas are very unique and controversial. She wanted to find a way to copyright my blog. And that's what she found Substack could offer that at the time, a year ago, uh, no other blog or website was offering. And so um, that was a big plus. Now, I don't know if uh, Medium or any of the others now are. And I would love uh, Kate to have a, um, uh, one of these forums about the pros and cons of different uh, blogging sites to learn that stuff. But for me, it was recommended for me because Substack will um, copyright your material. So if anybody uses it out there on the internet without your permission, you have a recourse. Um, so. Thank you. I'm going to say one other thing about Substack. Um, Katie, I'm going to embarrass you for a minute. Are you ready? <laughs> Okay, so Katie right here in the purple. Um, on my Substack last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember when it was, I um, put a poem from Unbelieve out there. And then I, I asked people, I think it was either 
either tell me your favorite color or what state you live in. And I'm going to pick two people to win a signed copy of the book. And Katie was one of the winners of my book. And this morning, was it just this morning, Katie, that you posted that? Okay. So I have my purple book and I have these purple padded mailers. And then I have my green book and a green padded mailer. So if people buy both books they get a purple one because it's a little bit bigger and if you buy a green one like from me it's green so i didn't know that katie's absolute favorite color in the whole entire world is purple like she adores purple so she gets my book in the mail i signed it for her she's putting it in her instagram story she shows the package she shows the book then she starts reading it then she shows other things and, and she's like making my whole entire day and then she says i have the stuff i'm supposed to be at tonight but i'm gonna come <laughs> i'm gonna come listen to you talk and i'm so and i freaking love that like i love the connections where and i don't know how katie found my Substack, but the connections that you can make on social media and then you just never know. And I, I encourage people. Now, if you're a writer, you know this, but sometimes people don't realize how much it means to us when other people share our books or share our poems or share our work. We don't, we don't think to do that. Um, I'm always doing it because I have a bookstagram, but also because I would love it when people do it for me. So I try to do it for other people. Um, but if anybody does, like, I love signing copies and sending them to people rather than you buy that on Amazon, which is also great. Cause then that makes my sales ranking go up or whatever. Um, but that was just a cool sub stack connection that I made with Katie. And then here she is. <laughs> welcome Katie. Well, I love that. And Kate, and for those of you, you know, Katie, welcome. <laughs> this is writing for life is, um, a community for spiritual writers with resources mm -hmm. and, events both online and person for spiritual writers um and we try to have a pretty broad tent and um you know but i feel like that's a holy spirit moment so thank you i'm glad that you're here all right is there anybody else who wants to chime in with a question or a comment maybe katie needs to speak now that she's been found no just kidding katie you don't have, no you don't have to <laughs> does someone else or are you trying to come up we can't hear you katie we're we trying to and denise Maybe, maybe let's let Denise go and then Katie, you can go next if you, we can hear you. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Denise. Hi, good, good evening, everybody. Um, you. Sorry, I got in late, but from what I've heard, I love your story. I love your candor. I love your energy. And I hope God blesses <laughs> you with everything you do. Um, I heard, I think when I got on, you're, are you self-published? Are all three of your books self-published? Or I, I have four traditionally published books from 2006, okay. seven, eight, and nine that I don't want people to buy. And then I okay. self-published my, my poetry book in 2021. I self-published okay. it. But then I met a hybrid publisher, Lake Drive Books, David Morris. He published Lake. this one with Lake Drive. And then we just re-released my self-published book also with Lake Drive. And then my third oh. book will be with Lake Drive. And then we'll see after that. If the rest we keep going with Lake Drive, or if I try to get um, like a more traditional publisher, where they just give me this big, huge royalty check, and then I live happily ever after. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, <laughs> me too. Also, piggybacking off of that, and thank you for clarifying that. I'm sorry I had to ask yeah, you to repeat. No problem. Why did you choose to go hybrid versus continuing with? Uh, self-publishing on your own? What are the pros and cons? Um, self-publishing was such a big headache for me. Um, you also missed the part where my first edition of my book, the, the font was microscopic and no one could read it. And I just made all of these errors with the formatting and I didn't know what I was doing. And I just really liked the idea of <laughs> having someone in my corner, someone to help me. Um, yes. Now, saying all that, there are some projects that I have that I will probably self-publish. I unschooled my children, which is another topic for another day, but I have okay. written ebooks about that. And an ebook I wrote in 2014 still sells sometimes 10 to 15 copies a month um, okay. all these years later. So I am going to 
redo that and probably put it out there. It probably wouldn't be a fit for Lake Drive and I don't necessarily want to try to find a publisher for it. So I would probably mm -hmm. self-publish that since I, I know more about what I'm doing. Um, so it was really for me having someone in my corner, having someone to help, having his connections that he could um, get me in front of other people. And I've been really, really pleased with it. Now, I will say I... I am a professional writer and a professional editor, and my daughter is a professional graphic designer. So my costs are very, very, very low. And for both of my books, I had it all ready to go and edited and everything. And we just did a quick copy edit. So I had to pay out of pocket, besides the little bit I gave my daughter, $500 for, my, for this one. Okay. And this one, $0. Because I had, again, I had already had all of the work done and then he did some stuff in house. He didn't even have to hire anybody to do anything. This, my third one will probably be the most expensive. Um, but even that maybe, maybe five or $600. Now that's okay. not typical for everyone. Like I said, I've been writing for decades. I'm a professional editor myself and my daughter will trade me food for <laughs> for cover design <laughs> so awesome. um that might not be as easy for everybody else but i do still dream of a big publishing deal just because i like the idea of a big check that i get <laughs> at the beginning yeah. and then a marketing team that um because lake drive doesn't have a marketing team david is on his own with an intern right now so uh, yeah, I'm just feeling my way through and I'm open to a lot of things. Um, but I encourage people if, I mean, to be, to get a high, I don't know how strict all the, all the hybrid publishers are. I know that Lake Drive is not taking on a lot of new authors because they're, they're pretty full at that capacity. So you'd have to find someone willing to do it. And I've found that the more willing someone is to publish you, the more money they're going to charge you typically. Mm. Um, mm. And so self-publishing, you are keeping all the royalties. You are, if you just do it on Amazon, like I did, it's free to put it out there. You don't have to do like Amazon doesn't charge you any money. And um, see, I, and, and it's hard to get someone to publish you if you don't have a platform. And that's why I self-published it, hoping that I could get the book out there and that would build my platform. Someone reads the book, tells their friend, they come follow me. It's been it's been slow going. Like I have a big platform for my white girl learning Instagram, but that is strictly a space for black, indigenous, other authors of color where I promote their books. It's not um where I do my personal stuff. So I have like 14,000 followers there, but I don't count that as my platform. Maybe a publisher would feel differently. I don't know, but I have about 3000 followers on Instagram and I know you can get book deals without that. Um, it's a tricky system out there. It's sometimes it's who, you know, sometimes it's what you're writing. Sometimes it's your platform. And I just have a lot to say and I want people to read it. And the response that I get, like, every single day like so when katie messaged me this morning and i was so excited i get stuff like that maybe not as wonderful as katie's but <laughs> every day and it never gets old like i will jump off the couch and start clapping or jumping up and down like i just it's so exciting to me to connect with people they resonate with what i said and I, I told a bunch of my journey, like out of conservative Christian white evangelicalism, all of that and divorce and everything. And it just feels like I'm redeeming so much of my past by being able to write about it now. And even though I don't even really call myself a Christian at this moment for several different reasons, um, so many of my friends are Christians. I have pastor friends. I, it's just it's because we share the, these common values and it's not this list of beliefs. It's we want to love people. And we're like my friend Trey says, who's a pastor in Florida, love is the commitment to wholeness, like being committed to the wholeness of other people. And that's a lot of Christianity. I don't see that. I don't see people. I see people wanting to change people, wanting them to be someone different. And I am committed to people being who they are, who they um who they were made to be so 
Yeah, I don't know how I got on that from, from your self-publishing question. <laughs> well, I do you want to circle back to one thing Denise said? So thank you so much for that and for the follow-up, Marla. Um, just to say, Denise, what I would recommend, I think that hybrid publishing can be really wonderful or it can be a scam or something in the middle. So what I recommend is that you talk to other writer friends and colleagues and sort of you know, ask about the money and, you know, don't go with a group that you don't know somebody and can't trust a colleague or a friend to tell you the real deal. Because mm -hmm. I do think that there's a lot. And even then, even if, you know, there's a good or a good um, company and there are many, you know, that are trying, that are mission driven or just, you know, good small business. Um, I would just make sure that, you know, ask critical questions about the cost, the cost pricing. So, and happy to talk more about that offline if it's useful. Um, awesome. But I, I want to, um, thank you. And if we, I want to, if anybody else has an urgent question, but I just want to ask the conceptual question that I had at the beginning, Marla, which is why poetry? I think what's so amazing about your journey is that you have all this prose, which I think is really unusual. <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't have 40,000 words lying around ready to turn into poetry. So first of all, that's a gift, you know, a gift that you have clearly is, um, and so but I, I'm, I'm asking this Socratically, so I'm not saying, you know, you know <laughs> that I can imagine what you're going to say, but can you just talk about like what, why, and you already touched on it, which is like the world is so noisy. There are so many words, people's bandwidth are so tight. So is that like the main reason? Or again, maybe some of, we heard some of this in some of your poetry, like you can communicate, express, explore ideas in ways that you can't through prose. So can you just maybe end us with sort of why poetry versus prose? Or again, it's not an either or, right? It's a both <laughs> and. But, but when do you turn to poetry, I guess is what I'd ask. Yeah, that's a really great question. And, I, and there is no one answer. I do very much believe that in a world that is saturated with words and there's so many words and you're fighting for people to their attention, even their attention span. Like if you see something short, you're going to read it. If you see something long, you're like, eh, too long. There's even the like too long did not read or whatever. Like that's just visually we see something and it's, it's too, it's too much for us. And I do believe that you can, say something really powerfully and something really short and people will remember it. Uh, it's more memorable. And I have, I mean, behind me, I don't know if you can tell, these are all books that I've read. So the, I have four bookshelves and there are no white authors on these particular bookshelves. I have a little bookshelf upstairs with my white authors, but um, these, all of these books I have read, but in my bedroom are two more bookshelves full of books I have not read yet. So some I get free from publishers, some I buy used, some I buy to support friends. There are so many books, there's like 30 million books on Amazon or whatever it is, you are competing with a lot of words. And so when people tell me, I picked up your book, I started to read and I couldn't put it down because it's like little bit, little bit, little bit. And you feel like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. And so it keeps people's, it keeps people's attention more. Now I will say, if you go to my Instagram, either white girl learning or Marla Taviano, there's a 2200 character word limit for Instagram. And I don't know how many words that is, but there are many, many, many days when I go all the way to the character limit. So I'm writing, I'm telling stories, I'm writing prose, I'm doing book reviews. I'm putting words out there, like I'm getting it, getting them out there. But I have just found it, it sets me apart. That's, that's all I can say is that if you see a ton of words and then you see some short words, you might pick these, these short words. And like I said, with the Substack, there are times I love these people. They're my friends. I want to read their words. And there's some people I, I definitely do make time to read the words, but mine is just a little poem. Like most people can, when they see that, they will probably just read the poem. It all actually fits in their email before they even click over to the sub stack. So yeah, and it's, it's a great exercise in discipline. Like how many of these words do you actually need <laughs> like i think a lot of the words that we use um are fluff they're unnecessary so it's been a lot of fun to see how i can whittle 
this down and it's just visually I really really like um I just really like how it looks on a on a page um it's kind of like art people are drawing and doodling in the white spaces right. and um a little tiny poem with just part of a sentence in it can spark discussion and so yeah I just I think I might be doing this for quite a while um or I might do like a mixture, like a book that's kind of some prose, some poetry, but I really like the short, the short format and saying um, a lot and just a little bit of words. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, really interesting. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're at our hour and this has just been such a rich and interesting conversation. So first of all, thank you so much. And and really inspiring, the last thing you said about, you know, it almost reminds me of a spiritual practice of simplicity or, you know, is like, mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, one of the things I'm really interested in is writing as a spiritual practice. And I just think that there's a lot in your process that's really rich and has a lot of the process itself sounds like, an, you know, a getting to the core and the discernment. So um, congratulations mm -hmm. on the launch of and can you hold your books up again just so we can see them um, and believe and jaded um, with like, like drive books. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know, you know, please y'all check out Marla's Substack. She mentioned it, her Instagram. Um, can you just as a final Marla, just remind us how we can find you, your website, your Instagrams and anything else Substack that you want to share in terms of how to find you? Yeah. Marla Taviano. Uh, Marla Taviano. Dot com. I, I think that's my, <laughs> I think that's my website. It needs some updating. Um, I hang out mostly on Instagram. So at Marla Taviano and at white girl learning, I'm on threads, which has been kind of fun and threads. I have, I've tried to keep that. Um, I try to, I try to do a mixture. I don't want to be the writer. That's just always talking about myself and my books all the time. I try to talk about other people. I try to talk about other things. I just like connecting with people and my books are not going to be for everyone, but they are for a lot of people. And I've really enjoyed all the connections that I've made. I just went to Wilmington, North Carolina for the weekend to help a friend open. And she did a pop-up bookshop. We met online. Another friend that I met through Bookstagram, I picked her up on the way. And then we went to this pop-up bookshop and that's just kind of been my thing. Ever, well, ever since that zoo trip when we stayed with all of those, <laughs> those families, but it's really cool. I don't go to church right now, but I have met so many people online and in real life that had just a connection, whether it's through my books and words or something that we're both interested in or care about. And it's been really great. So thank you all for coming. I know it's um, a sacrifice to, to carve an hour out of your busy no, lives was, and I really um, appreciate yeah, it. Katie, yeah. Just say, they say Katie couldn't get her mic to work, but she's saying in the chat that she, um, that she's glad to be here. And anyway, you, you can look at the chat afterwards, but anyway, <laughs> thank you all for joining. And this is a monthly group. We try to meet on the second Tuesday of the month. So stay tuned and um, we'll be announcing the next uh, writer in the um, in the newsletter and you can follow us at writingforlife.com. And again, thank you so much, Marla. You really have given me a lot to think about and um, leaving encouraged and inspired. Uh, so blessings on your writing and your continued um, faith journey and, and your, you know, your journey uh, sounds like multifaceted and interesting and compelling journey. So blessings in that. And um, thanks to everyone for being here and we'll see you next month, hopefully. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone.